My name is Havan Gurma. I work as a Skadden Fellow at Disability Rights Advocates. In other words, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> What's a lawyer? Well, there are many stereotypes, negative stereotypes of lawyers. People who never give you a straight answer. People who just want your money. People who aren't even people, they're sharks. These images are so strongly embedded in our culture that people tell me, half joking, I don't like lawyers. But when people think of lawyers, they really think of just one type of lawyer. Think about it. Imagine, when you envision a lawyer, what do you see? Do you see a woman? Is that the first thing that comes to mind? How about someone using a wheelchair? Do you see someone who's deaf and signing? Or even, do you see someone who's nice? There are many types of lawyers, and public service lawyers are changing what it means to be a lawyer. These are people who work and advocate for communities they love. For some of these lawyers, personal experiences fuel the desire to put an end to widespread injustice. People who experience challenges sometimes develop strengths that make them great advocates. Lawyers take experiences of poverty, race, gender, disability, or other forms of discrimination and use that knowledge as a ladder for legal advocacy. For me, a lifetime of needing to advocate for myself prepared me for the field of law. My disability is deaf blindness. Helen Keller paved a path of possibilities for deaf blind children and adults who came after her. These individuals need to move forward as pioneers in a world designed for people who can see and hear. Many members of minority groups move forward as pioneers. The process of pioneering one's way through obstacles builds strong self-advocacy skills that can be used in the field of law or other forms of advocacy. As a pioneer, I went to the perfect college, Lewis and Clark. They called their football team the Pioneers. Their favorite place to hang out in downtown Portland, Pioneer Square. What else? Oh, and they called their school bus the Pioneer Express. As a pioneer, I lived for two years in the dorms at Lewis and Clark, and I ate at the cafeteria. The cafeteria had about five different food stations. And there was a menu at the door, and people would read the menu and choose what they wanted to eat. Blind students like myself couldn't read the menu. The staff at the cafeteria offered to read me the menu, but I couldn't hear it. As a blind student, my first choice would be to read the menu in Braille. Braille takes time to produce, so we compromised. The staff agreed to email me the menu at the start of each meal, and I would be able to read it on my computer using a screen reader. It was a great idea, but the cafeteria constantly forgot to email the menus. Since I couldn't read the menu, and I couldn't hear the staff in the cafeteria, I couldn't choose what I was going to eat. So after classes, I would pick a station at random. I would go up and take whatever what was, that was served by the staff behind the counter. I would take it to the table, and only then would I realize what I was going to eat. There were some unhappy surprises. As a busy student with classes and preparing for exams and writing papers, 
the last thing I needed was this added frustration. But sometimes they did remember to send the menus. And when they did, I was thrilled to have choices. For example, if the menu said Station 3, tortellini with smoked Gouda cheese, I would know to skip Stations 1 and 2 and go straight to Station 3. When they remembered to send the menus, life was delicious. But they regularly forgot to send the menus. For the first few months, I didn't do anything about it. I live and operate in a world that's designed for people who can see and hear. And I figured this would just be another thing I would have to deal with, like not being able to drive or not being able to watch the latest Grammys or people not knowing how to communicate with someone who's deafblind. One of my best friends, when she first met me, didn't know how to talk to someone who's deafblind. In our international law class at Harvard, she was assigned to sit next to me, and we all had assigned seating. And she thought she could wave, but what if I didn't see it? And if she speaks, would I be able to hear it? So, she did the most logical thing for a student to do. She went on to Facebook and sent me a message saying, Hi, Hobbin, I'm sitting right next to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to teach people how to communicate. I love those who embrace diversity. And there's all kinds of diversity. Occasionally, there are individuals or organizations who are not willing to make accommodations for people with disabilities. And there's that decision. Do you just deal and let it go? Or do you do something about it? And those menus at that cafeteria was a pivotal moment for me when I decided that I should do something for myself and for future blind students who came to that college or anyone else who needed menus in alternative formats. So I explained to the manager at the cafeteria that I paid to eat at the cafeteria. And like all the other students, I deserved access to the menu so I could take advantage of these services. The manager told me they're very busy. He's doing me a big favor and I needed to stop complaining and be more appreciative. I don't know about you, but if there's chocolate cake at Station 4 and no one tells me, <laughs> I'm not feeling appreciative. <laughs> so after several incidents of missed chocolate cake, I had enough. I tried something new. The Americans with Disabilities Act ADA was passed in 1990. Congress passed this law to protect the rights of people with disabilities. The law symbolizes a change from treating people as second-class citizens. The ADA states that businesses, like the cafeteria, are required to make reasonable accommodations for individuals with disabilities. Emailing a menu is a reasonable accommodation. I told the manager that if he would not send emails consistently, I would sue. To tell you the truth, I had no idea how I would do that. <laughs> I was 19. How would I afford a lawyer? I was nervous that lawyers and judges wouldn't understand. Besides, it's just a menu, right? Lewis and Clark did an excellent job of giving me my course materials, my textbooks, my exams in Braille. Students all across the country, blind students in other colleges, struggle to get basic access to books, even today. So who was I to complain?
my mother grew up in Eritrea amidst a 30-year war with Ethiopia. When she was 18, she trekked for two weeks from Eritrea to Sudan, then from Sudan through a refugee organization, made it to America for a better life. So who was I to complain? I was worried that someone would think that access to a menu was too trivial, that it was a privilege and not a right. But at the same time, I was also excited with the possibility of making the college a better place, even if it was just one other blind student that came after me. I had a vision of helping other people. I had a vision of joining the civil rights movement, maybe even becoming a lawyer. I had a vision of eating that chocolate cake. <laughs> After teaching the cafeteria staff about the ADA, everything changed. They agreed to provide menus consistently, and they did. Learning about the ADA changed their attitude. They originally thought that providing access for students with disabilities was a favor, something they can do in their free time when they were in the right mood. Learning about the ADA changed the culture in the cafeteria. The ADA creates legal obligations to treat people as equals. Schools nowadays admit students with disabilities, and that's great. Access goes beyond the schoolhouse game. We need access to online learning tools, to math and science courses, to study abroad programs, and yes, even dessert menus. My experiences as a pioneer inspired me to become a lawyer. I now work in Berkeley at Disability Rights Advocates, a national nonprofit organization. One stereotype of lawyer is that they're just after your money. DRA does not charge clients. Civil rights need to be accessible. One tool used by lawyers, including a DRA, is the class action litigation. Class actions are when a group of people come together to sue someone who's doing something wrong. It's a way to help improve access to important things like education or employment and health care at a national level. A few years ago, several students at UC Berkeley came to DRA with concerns. Students with print reading disabilities need access to course materials in alternative formats, like Braille, large print, audio, digital. The university was taking so long to provide these materials that students were at risk of failing their courses. Through the help of lawyers at DRA, students were able to reach an agreement with the, with the university. The university now has new policies that are turning Berkeley into a model for other schools. Lawyers, first and foremost, educate their communities. I know that if people learn how to help, they will. So if you're a programmer, a web engineer, learn about the web accessibility guidelines. If you're an architect, Learn about the ADA guidelines for new constructions. We can choose to make our communities accessible. It's in our power to provide access for everyone. Those individuals who've had to move forward as pioneers are particularly well positioned to help their communities, whether as lawyers or as other advocates. My name is Havan Gurma, and I hope I've given you a new vision of lawyers. Thank you. Mm -hmm.